Hello, everyone, and welcome to Credential Compromise. Well, what now? An offensive and defensive look at user credential compromise. Before we dive in here, I want to provide a brief overview of what this is going to be and what it's not going to be. So this is really going to be a basic overview of methodologies, external attack mapping, and really some tips and tricks for all level of folks. I think there's something in here for, for everyone and looking forward to diving in. Uh, really, this is a combination of things that I wish I knew when I was starting out my career in penetration testing and as I have evolved over the last few years. What this is not going to be is a step-by-step -step guide for offensive security tooling, really in-depth methodology, and it's not going to be a deep dive into red teaming and adversary emulation. So who am I? I am Nate Kirk. I am based out of Dallas. I am a practice manager at Praetorian, and I specialize in network penetration testing and red teaming. I've been in the consulting world for about four years now, where I've executed, led, and really dove into the offensive security side. Before I got into offensive security, I was a sysadmin and was a blue teamer. Uh, as you can see, I am a dog owner. Uh, he might make a guest appearance in this. And I am a non-certified beer taster. Uh, you'll often see me at some of the breweries here in Dallas uh, enjoying a beer, especially uh, during the fall now. So background and agenda. So this talk has been on my mind for quite a bit. Um, as I started leading teams and working with folks that, you know, I was watching their shoes and had kind of sometimes stepped a little bit too far and, and wasn't quite ready and prepared, uh, I would often get the question and have the question myself of, I've got credentials, well, what do I do now? Um, meaning uh, attack path was successful, especially with external penetration testing. You end up with credentials, but you're not really sure where to go next. Um, it's a bad problem to have, uh, but it is a problem. Um, so this talk is going to definitely talk about that preparation part, some of the attack paths that have to do with leading into credential compromise, uh, the post-exploitation size side, and also weaponizing OSINT, which is going to be a fun topic to cover. Um, the agenda here is broken into two phases, uh, first starting out with the offensive perspective and then diving into the defensive perspective. So let's jump into the offensive perspective. So diving in, preparation is key. And really to kind of take a step back, let's pretend the scope of an engagement or this engagement that we're going to hypothetically talk about is an external penetration test. So we're taking the role of an external attacker, trying to get into either data from the external perspective or even get into the internal client or consumer environment. Um, so really any external engagement like this, I like to kind of take a methodical approach and first start with OSINT. Uh, pretty much every engagement should start with OSINT. And I think a lot of people are becoming familiar with OSINT or open source intelligence gathering these days. Uh, I've been seeing a lot of stuff, especially on Twitter, talking about like, do the post a picture of where you're at, try to track it down. Um, it's really awesome. I enjoy doing that, but there's also could be kind of a darker side of OSINT and, and being able to weaponize it against an organization. Uh, so with that, I usually start out with what's called like an external mapping phase and looking to see what I can find publicly regarding a client's uh, DNS kind of records, looking for any kind of IP addresses, um, and then really diving into what their technology stack is and, and what they're using uh, as a platform. It's especially important with understanding what a client's mail flow is as we start looking at some of the attack paths we're going to talk about. Uh, some of this stuff is kind of boring. Uh, you know, it's more fun to kind of dive into an engagement, start kicking off, you know, any kind of vulnerability scanning, looking for things to, to go exploit, doing some password spraying and guessing, start sending out phishing emails. But if you're not really prepared, you're not setting yourself up for success. And with that is just doing OSINT and seeing what, what you can additionally find. Um, you know, for some additional context, we're usually given a scope for an engagement. But sometimes when you're doing OSINT, you find things that are beyond the scope that should have been added to the scope in the first place, or even that the client didn't know about and probably should. So I always make sure testers are doing you know, proper OSINT and documenting as they go. Um, along with that, kind of the more fun side is looking for employee names and emails. So that's diving into former breach lists, meaning third party breach lists, not the client themselves but where their employees may have signed up for a service previously that was breached. Um, some of these are older. There's some newer breach lists that have been kind of emerging over the last few years, but regardless, they are useful. Um, and then additionally, social networking sites, you know, the classic LinkedIn, going and looking at people out there. Everyone does it these days, easy to do. So external mapping. This is one of the keys to any kind of external penetration test. This is a little boring. It's a spreadsheet, but I promise it's worth doing. Um, it's it's really to stay organized and not to overlap. Uh, this is my way of doing it. Um, folks, folks 
I've seen do like cherry tree doing other types of pen testing documentation. I've seen folks doing it on a word doc. Don't know why anybody would do that. Um, I've seen some people doing it in Markdown. Um, really, as long as you're tracking and keeping a good clean list of where you've been, what you're seeing and where you want to go, it really should work out. The reason why and the reason I recommend people use an Excel sheet is because it's easy to filter. Um, and also you can really automate a lot of the stuff to feed into like an Excel sheet. Um, last year, Omar Beta and myself presented on a Jupyter notebook that actually spit out an OSINT document similar to this. And you know you can automate Nessus and other vulnerability scanners to output documents like this um, for you to go through and then fill out. Um, really, it's up to the in person of how they want to do this. This is my way of doing it, um, but do highly recommend automating a lot of this structure. So really, we're just trying to map out where we could go and what there is and really read out the noise is the biggest part. Um, a lot of stuff we see on externals is either dead, not accessible, either blocked off by a firewall or is just no longer in production. Um, so it's good to get a lot of that noise out of the way so you can focus on what's important. So building an analytical approach to an attack path. So this is really just a fancy way of saying, slow down, take your time and actually plan something out instead of just rushing into an engagement and, and kind of executing as you go. So really doing a good job at OSINT and then doing that initial map of the external client, we can start to see what can we leverage against them? Uh, what can we weaponize? And then also, are we getting familiar with this external? Are we seeing weird technology stacks? Are we seeing things that could be used as a pretext in phishing engagements? And are we other, seeing other like hitful tidbits that could lead us to compromising users? Um, I am gonna go a little bit deeper into this and provide two external attack paths that are still pretty popular. So this first one's pretty fun. Um, if you're not familiar with password spraying, it's pretty much bulk password guessing where we're using the same password and spraying it against a bunch of usernames or emails. Um, typically email accounts, um, that stays the constant throughout. Um, so what that means is I take a password that's usually commonly used, like season 2021, like right now, fall or winter 2021, and then spray that or guess that against maybe a thousand user accounts that I find. Um, it's still pretty popular. It's becoming harder to do as, as we'll talk about, there's more defensive mechanisms uh, that can be employed these days, um, but it's still a, a fun one to talk about. So when it comes to weaponizing OSM for this, I see a lot of people just jump in and just start password spraying things. And when I kind of say, hey, slow down, like kind of analyze before you attack, you start to catch kind of hiccups with it. And what I mean by that is, you know, let's say most organizations use Office 365 these days. Great service, easy to use. Problem is, is if you don't go and check that this the client you're targeting is using Office 365 and you've been password spraying all day or even all week and you're not getting anything and you come to me and I take a look and look at their MX records, which you may have missed, and they're actually using Google Workspace. Um, I've seen that before. That's why it's always best to kind of take a step back. It doesn't seem like you're actually weaponizing OSINT by knowing what their mail flow is and knowing where to attack and target and taking advantage of some of that. It really is. And same with uh, password policies. This is a bit of an oddity, but have seen it quite a bit of password policies being exposed externally. So let's say there's a password reset portal or maybe some documentation is leaking through an external help desk portal where it's not really sensitive, but to the right attacker and the right mindset, you could leverage it. So instead of me guessing short passwords and wasting time on that and not focusing on you know <clears throat> what could be a complex password, um, it could just be a, a character limit where if I know it's above 15 characters or I know it's above 10 or 12, I'm going to start tuning my guests, my guesses to go after that. So incredibly helpful as well. Um, other things, especially employee names, the more you collect and the more you can target and attack, the easier it's going to be to guess someone. Um, don't get me wrong, password guessing is not always the easiest thing, but you're kind of increasing your, your odds with the bet when you increase the number of employee names you have to guess against. So doing a good thorough job on OSINT really pays off on this. Because what if you collect a thousand usernames or emails and it's just that one extra, that's the one password you guess. You kind of never want to leave anything on the table when it comes to that. Um, breachless trends, this is a neat one. Um, so like I was saying a little bit a while ago, it's, you know, these are pretty outdated these days. I think the really common one we, we've seen people use is like the LinkedIn one. I believe that's three or four years old now. 
three or four year old passwords have been rotated multiple times, especially when you think most organizations have like a 90, 180 day, even a one year rotation. Those are pretty, pretty crusty. Um, so what I tell most folks and what I've seen is look at trends, um, meaning look at passwords that could be maybe a default password, like welcome to company name um, or have some sort of weird lead speak or complexity to them. Um, I've even seen and compromised users using like company name and year, but the company name is spelt slightly weird and different, like something you just wouldn't guess off the top of your head or even think about. So sometimes weaponizing a breach list doesn't necessarily come from just doing an inline password spray of taking passwords from breach list, taking usernames, spraying. It can sometimes be looking and analyzing what that data is and, and really leveraging it in a meaningful way. Um, another thing you can often hear me kind of using email and username, kind of mixing those two up. Sometimes they're the same. A lot of times they're not. So let's say, for example, my email address is nate.kirk at example.com. Makes sense. But what if my internal like Active Directory username or just you know internal authentication mechanism username is nkirk at example.com? Well, if I go and password guess against nate.kirk at example.com all day, I'm not going to ever guess that password or ever compromise that account, even if I do guess the right password, because you you don't have the right username. Um, so, but if I do use that right password against that nkirk at example.com, it would be the right username. So taking that extra time to validate usernames or validate if email addresses are indeed their usernames does pay off. Um, a lot of times I've seen folks struggle, 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 and then all of a sudden, hey, just take a step back. Did you validate? No, go validate. Sure enough, they get an immediate hit off of like fall 2021. So sometimes it helps just to take that extra step, dive a little bit deeper and weaponize what you find. Um, a lot of times I find username conventions off of um, like breach list data where someone's, you start seeing some oddities and you're like, ah, it doesn't match their email addresses. I bet that's a username convention. And even going a bit further and analyzing uh, metadata from files that are uploaded, um, like when documents are, are signed and, and created or PDFs are rendered, you know, the username of the computer will often be rendered into that as metadata and being able to pull that using tools like PowerMeta or PyMeta, incredibly powerful to do. And then another common attack, I think we all know this one leading to credential compromise is email phishing. Um, this is always a favorite one because you can come up with different pretexts or kind of the like the thoughts that, that could get someone to, to click um, is pretty fun. So with this um, and weaponizing OSINT on these are, especially that mail flow again, understanding what kind of tech stack they're using and being able to kind of tune and target what that tech stack is. You know, maybe there's a blog post someone just recently posted on um, how to bypass a certain flavor of a web filter, or maybe there's actually an exploit for one of those um, email filters or, or web gateways. Um, it's it's anything is kind of possible with that, um, especially with uh, external mapping as well. So when you're doing that initial OSINT run and doing that initial external mapping, like we talked about earlier, diving into that stuff makes a difference and looking to see, you know, you know, going to the company website and like, oh, look, they've got like their corporate events posted here. I see they're all kind of drinking the same coffee here. That's a bad example. But, you know, looking to see what kind of pretext you can come up with based on that. Um, some of them could be a little bit more evil, like oh, there's a charity this company is very specifically involved in. E sending emails regarding this charity might look normal and blend in. Um, you know, you can find some interesting things off that. Employee profiling is also an interesting one um, and, and pulling as many names as you can in and then kind of dissecting those and, and kind of building specific pretexts for specific targets. Um, and that could be another kind of evil one that I like to do personally is target interns. Um, they typically don't have a good handle on information security yet, depending on the industry. Um, and it's a little evil, but, but something fun to do. And you can typically find and sort through these people using tools and, and the right approach to like LinkedIn, for example. Um, also kind of doing the higher risk, high reward stuff of targeting executives, things like that. Um, so really taking that extra step, diving into what you can leverage and then being successful could lead to, to a credential compromise. So your password guessing or your phishing campaign was successful, and what do you know? You've got credentials. Well, what now? 
So with this, I always feel like the room's on fire a bit and kind of saying to myself, this is fine when I've got credentials and I'm, I'm a little bit concerned maybe the blue team's catching on or or maybe I'm going to get reported to help desk or, or maybe there's a SOC analyst that saw something weird today. I always kind of tell folks and have to tell myself occasionally is it's fine. Um, we got this. We have the right approach. We just need to kind of chill out. And with that, I, I usually do this in kind of a three-phased approach of burn, wait, and then leverage. Um, so burn, what I typically mean by that is burn your infrastructure. Um, really just remove it from the external side. Um, a lot of this is, especially when you're worried about getting caught by like the blue team, um, this really applies to kind of more general net pin. Um, like if you're having an objective with maybe the client that they want to test some some defensive capabilities and, and we're trying to evade that or even some like really light red teaming. Um, this isn't really advanced red teaming stuff, but did want to call it out there. Um, really, if you're just really kind of generically worried about getting caught. Um, with that burning, meaning remove public access, it makes it so much more difficult to triage where if you have a really good pretext and a really good phishing campaign, when they go try to triage that, they sandbox it. What if the link's just dead and the pretext looks legitimate enough where they're kind of like, ah, I don't know, like we should probably reset this person. And they're kind of slow about it. Instead of your phishing campaign is still alive and it immediately just goes to like a fake Officer 65 landing page or some like obvious credential harvesting page, they're going to probably immediately go disable that account. That person's compromised. Like this is bad. Um, or even if you're feeling a little bit more, more nefarious, you can actually um, kind of do a closed loop with a lot of these pretexts, meaning the pretext itself, once that user submits credentials, it then forwards them on to a legitimate website that has to do with the pretext. Um, or even once, uh, once you're done with this campaign, like let's say you get 10 hits within a couple minutes, a couple hours, who knows, but you're worried about getting caught. By burning it, you can just redirect your phishing site to just go straight to like a legitimate website. The redirect's a little funky, but if some, if it gets sandboxed and just hits a regular website that has to do with the pretext, much more difficult, it takes more time to triage while you're having fun with those credentials. Um, the biggest part here, and I think the biggest takeaway is kind of being chill, waiting for things to simmer down, mostly with yourself where you've got credentials, don't get overexcited, don't start missing things and not leveraging what you've got. Just take your time leverage these credentials carefully. So I want to talk about this more later on, but timing makes a difference when using credentials. Let's say you catch credentials during the middle of the day, you might not want to use them immediately. What if logging into something and, you know, triggering some alert ruins your day? That that would not be fun if you get caught doing that or, or trip up some person. Um, and also, like I said, don't forget about all that pre-work you did with that external mapping. Um, and really just be prepared for the worst with this. What if what if your credential gets burned immediately or, or something happens? Um, that's it's always a concern. So with this out of the way, let's talk about the more fun stuff. So let's say you've got credentials. You're not worried about being caught. All that's fine. Let's talk about the next phase, um, authenticated information gathering. So we've got credentials. Let's pretend this client's got Office 365. Um, I, I talk a lot about Officer 65 because, you know, the majority of, of clients and corporations we test are using it in some some manner. Um, even if they're not using it for mail flow, it can still be utilizing it for some of the other services that they have. Um, so, like I say, before kind of going for the gold and hitting that VPN portal, what if we grab some additional information? So if we do get these creds burned, if the, the user freaks out, resets their password, something happens, um, we want maybe an additional way to get in or just more data. We don't want to leave empty handed for the day. We can go after Azure and after 0365. Granted, you know, these don't always work. Depends on the maturity of the organization. Depends on if pen testers before you have found this. Um, but I'd say like 60% of the time I find some gap here. Um, and the gap is within conditional access policies with, with Azure and Microsoft online services. Um, conditional access policies, if you're not familiar, kind of think, Firewalls for your services, pretty easy to set up. They're a little tricky. They're mostly turned on by default now. So if you have a new tenancy in Office 365, they should be turned on. But if you haven't set, if you have an older tenancy, these were not originally turned on for all services. Um, the biggest gaps I typically see is with the AZ module and the MS Online module with PowerShell being able to kind of hook into those backend services and being able to query them. Um, the same with Office 365 uh, Exchange Web Services or EWS, which is kind of a legacy protocol. Um, 
can still be leveraged to, to go hook into Office 365 and pull some good data. Um, also, have to say it's still looking at you on prem OWA and EWS. Just because you migrated to Azure and Office 365 for Mailflow does not mean your on prem stuff doesn't still work. Um, have seen that oftentimes where really good setup in Office 365, great conditional access policies can't get anywhere. You look on prem and oh no, OWA is not protected. I can just log in and do whatever I want. Concerning. Um, I really wanted to call out here a huge uh, call out for uh, DAFTAC. Um, highly recommend if you're interested in this kind of stuff and interested in the, the Office 365 realm, which I'm talking about here, go out and check out his, his uh, GitHub repo. Great stuff. Um, really great tooling and really appreciate his support with the community over the last few years. So with that, I want to kind of call out one of my favorites here and some of the you know, kind of post exploitation you can do with this information gathering. Um, so this is leveraging the MS online PowerShell module. Um, could have MFA enabled, could not, always worth trying. Um, the specific commands you can find out in DAFTAC's uh, cloud cheat sheets, really interesting and helpful stuff. This is just an example here of the connect MSOL service where you actually connect up. Um, typically, if they've got MFA, you'd be prompted, you kind of know when to back out. Um, and then this is the command, like getting the MSLO user command where it pulls down just by default, the user principal name, which would be like that sign in or username. Um, and then also the display name, um, kind of interesting, right? You can take these offline. You've got all their usernames now. So let's say you've got 500 from OSINT. You've been password spraying, you pop five or 10. Well, now all of a sudden you've got maybe a thousand, 1500 that you didn't have. And it broadens that you know, capability of you spraying and popping more accounts and, and potentially finding other users, maybe more powerful users um, with a bad password set. Um, really, that's kind of known, but some of the more interesting things is if you do the dash all with the git msol user command, it will pull all attributes that are synced up to Azure. Um, that meaning it is optional per client. So some clients have different things. Some just check the box of like sync all attributes, have fun. Some are more selective about it. It, it depends on like the, the organization, right? Like there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, but some organizations do sync up phone numbers, addresses, job titles of the person, even supervisors, uh, names and addresses and, and contact information. Talk about kind of social engineering haven where you all of a sudden have a lot more detail and a lot more context to people. Um, I've, I've had successful engagements where we're stuck on an external manage to get an account, get into this kind of data. All of a sudden we can start calling people, trying to capture MFA tokens, doing things like that and, and really escalating off of this kind of this point here. Um, another thing, which is probably my favorite subject with this is the description field. Um, if you've done internal penetration tests before, maybe you've seen the description field containing passwords where that same description field gets synced up to Azure AD contains the same password. Um, probably my favorite example of that is we were doing an engagement uh, organization up there had synced the description field with service accounts as well. So they were syncing at pretty much every user up to Azure AD, including all their service accounts. Pretty poor service account management where a lot of service accounts were DAs. They were syncing their DAs up there, synced a service account up there with the password in there that was a DA. That DEA was also a global admin in Azure and Office 365, so we've owned that. And then sure enough, no MFA on their VPN for service accounts because they're non-human. And all of a sudden we're inside their environment within the week as a DA. It's, you know, it's interesting the kind of stuff you can see. And granted, that's not every engagement, right? But every engagement, if you do the same steps over and over and kind of build out, stay to a regimented methodology, but still be willing to try new things, you'll eventually find cool stuff like that and, and be able to laugh and, and kind of reflect back on that like now for me. So did want to call this out as well, a little bit harder um, as a lot of the services that are used by these tools do have MFA most of the time, but it's always worth trying. Um, even if you're on a blue team and, and want to see what some of this does, it's, it's mostly all passive, um, but definitely worth a shot trying to do when you have credentials. Um, some great tools recently released over the last couple of years with Azure Hound, AAD internals, um, and then really some of the broad ones like Scout Suite and Road Tools. Um, these are great for kind of mapping out attack paths where you have a cloud foothold and are looking to either get internal or just looking to, to compromise additional um, entities up there. So 
moving away from cloud, moving to kind of the on-prem side. So remember this attack path I was talking about earlier, the attack, attack mapping here, or external mapping. Um, knowing where you can log in ahead of time is pretty much crucial to this. Um, so you've got credentials, you're kind of chill, you, you, got, you know where you're gonna go. All of a sudden you take this big long list, like let's say you've got a thousand and only like 20 were login portals, you can filter this down. Now you just have a nice long list of where you can go log into. You're not scrambling trying to run like Go Witness or Eyewitness, trying to find all these random portals. Once you have credentials and you're worried about a blue team blocking you out, you know exactly where to go from the get-go once you have the credentials. So doing this initial mapping phase is so important. Um, and also then knowing um, when you should log in or should you log in. Um, we're about to jump into that, but timing can make a difference, um, especially uh, with uh, MFA pushes, where if you're gonna start sending push notifications at the wrong time, could get you caught. Um, but also like, where should you log in? I just say, try it all and try it with every single account. That's the biggest thing. So if you pop 10 accounts, but one account is, you know, maybe a new user that you're not aware of, all of a sudden that one account didn't enroll in MFA and you've got internal access off the VPN for that. But the other nine accounts are set up properly. They're good to go. They, they're kind of longer term accounts, but that one account. And if you log in the first time with one of those accounts and are like, ah, they've got MFA, I'm done with this. If you don't try every account, you could leave something on the table and miss out on an opportunity. So try it all, try it everywhere, but take your time and, and document it as you go. Don't miss screenshots. So fun topic, MFA workarounds. So you've got the credentials, you know where you're logging in. Dang, they've got MFA set up, multi-factor authentication. Um, so let's say we're, we're targeting their VPN portal. Um, the timing is key with a lot of this stuff. Um, let's say you hit an account at 11 p.m. at night and this person's on the couch watching some TV. And they're like, I didn't just sign in, that's weird. I should probably report this. Um, or you hit it during the middle of the night and they're asleep and you're just sitting there, push, push, push. Why isn't this person hitting approve? And it's like, well, it's the middle of the night, they're asleep. So timing is key. I like to target right in the morning and right around lunchtime. So right when they're signing on, I look on LinkedIn, figure out where they're living, um, or even using some of that authenticated data I found from, from Azure AD or MS Online and look, oh, okay, they're in central time zone. I'm going to hit them right at 8 39 a.m central um oh they're on east coast i'll get up an hour early try to hit them then hit them right after lunchtime so when they're coming back it's just all about kind of getting them that repetition of you know when they sign every in every day they hit that approve it just blends in with their normal activity you want to avoid that suspicion especially when it's more like adversary simulation or doing you know some lighter red teaming Source IP restrictions, this is an interesting one. So let's say we just wanna bypass MFA completely. Um, when you're on-prem and you're working, do you notice you don't have to do MFA as often depending on the organization you're at? Well, that's because they have conditional access policies or have policies in place on, on their you know, authentication provider allowing certain IP addresses to kind of bypass their, their multi-factor authentication, which makes sense. You would assume someone coming from an IP address would be trusted but what if they're evil? What if what if it's me that just pulled up in your parking lot and is hanging out on your guest Wi-Fi? What if your Wi-Fi is Active Directory integrated with no certificates and I can just go sign into it and go out through your regular internet? What if I did that? What if what if you have it region based where anybody from the US can just log in, seen that bad idea? Um, but definitely start thinking, okay, I can't get around these push notifications. What if I try something else that's within reason and within scope, of course, but it's something to consider and put on the table if it's the right engagement for that. Um, you know, man, the middle MFA interception is becoming popular these days and it's becoming pretty mainstream, to be honest. Um, I, it's something that kind of, I didn't think would work and all of a sudden it started working a few years ago and now there's some really cool tools and, and offensive, uh, security tooling that that works great for it for proxying these connections like evil Gen X 2 is a great one i'd like to call out and it does take some tweaking and tuning and some some of that external mapping right um you know evil Gen X 2 uses specific fishlets that are very highly dependent per each organization and if you use the wrong one it's never going to work or even take some tuning and building and, and kind of customizing to get it to work and it takes that additional step to to get it working properly so a little bit, so kind of increasing the fund meter here, um, MFA enrollment and account takeover. 
Um, so let's say organization has its MFA enrollment exposed externally. It makes it convenient. It's understandable. Could it be abused? Absolutely. Um, so with this, there's really kind of two trains of thought with it, um, especially the way that I like to approach it is I go after people that likely have not set up MFA yet and are likely going to fall for a phishing campaign. It kind of falls on the same side of the, the road here. Um, again, evil with interns, a little bit evil with new hires. Um, you know, with, with these folks um, and what I've seen in the past is interns are kind of short, shorter term employees um, and likely just kind of keep hitting the, I'm just going to put off enrolling in my MFA for another couple of days. Um, and that couple of days turns into a couple of weeks if it's not being enforced properly or not enforced at all. Same with new hires, where if you have a, typically a 12 day grace period, I'll try to find, especially a large organization that are hiring on a lot of people at the same time. I'll target those groups of people, hopefully get one of them to, to either fall for a fish um, and then try to enroll myself in their MFA and take over their account in the middle of the night. Um, so they have no idea I've locked out their account but it's the middle of the night, sign of the VPN, establish persistence in some manner, move, and then I'm in. Um, or over a weekend where they just don't think about it. Um, another one that's a little bit higher risk, higher reward, but I'm seeing less of these days, which is good, is executives that just don't want MFA. Um, and they get some sort of pardon from security governance not to have MFA or a strict password policy. Um, it's becoming less common, but do want to call it out. It is higher risk where these people are becoming better trained. Um, they also have more security controls around them. There are some organizations that strictly watch executives and it's even a service now from some people like a premium service, a little bit higher risk, but higher reward where if you do compromise these people, they don't have MFA, all of a sudden you're the CFO, that's pretty wild. So high risk, high reward, up to you to try and up to kind of the scope and, and the limits you've got. So ramp ramp up of the fun zone here, gaps in MFA. Um, we did touch on this a little bit earlier. Um, really, if they've got really good MFA everywhere, you just wanna to try to find the holes in it. Um, especially when it comes to like conditional access policies, just finding that little tiny gap um, is a big one. Um, sometimes it has to do with EWS, like the legacy protocols that you, people just aren't disabling because there's some weird application that needs it. Um, that works a lot of times. Um, legacy infrastructure that's on-prem where they think it's shut down, but it's really not, um, or they just kind of forget about it and it's just hanging out there, like those on-prem exchange servers I was talking about, even on-prem SharePoint services, where it's like, oh, it's fine, it's shut down, but it's really not. Um, and then going a step further with that, the decommissioned infrastructure, these are probably my favorite kind of attacks where after you're done with it and you jump on a debrief call and they're like, no, 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 that's, that was shut down years ago. I, I don't know what you're talking about. And then pull up your screen, you walk them through kind of a, a demo of it. And they're like getting on the phone with the sysadmins and security immediately. Um, a couple examples of this would be um, as you're going through and mapping out that external phase of kind of marking down, like, this is pretty weird. I want to go back and double check this, especially when it comes to remote access and like RD gateways and, and like old horizon view instances, things like that. Um, a lot of times these were spun up and then spun down rapidly when the work from home craze happened and they maybe just spun them down, but didn't completely clean them up. Um, one of these examples is an RD gateway that I found. Um, I actually found it, I think over, it was earlier this year. And what it was, was the, the actual login portal, you know, with a, with a standard RD gateway to kind of takes you into a VDI pool. It's the standard Microsoft one. When you sign in, it takes you into like an RDP pool. You can launch out. When I signed in there, no MFA, but there's nothing there. And I was like, okay, well, this isn't anything crazy. But I started thinking about it and I was like, well, this thing is like, these technically can be used as like an RD gateway itself. Um, meaning I, I'm not launching like a VDI instance or connecting through it, like the web interface to like an, a known remote desktop um, instance somewhere else. Um, but I can actually use it as like a gateway into their environment. So what I did was I actually pulled some of that Azure information earlier you can go further than just users. You can pull computer names as well. So I pulled computer names, started looking at those, found what looked to be like a VDI server internally and could do a little bit of enumeration because you can look at groups in, in Azure AD as well, figured out I was in one of the groups that had access to that server and then actually use that external RD gateway to pivot in and connect to it through like an RDP um, client 
pivot through it into the internal and then connect into uh, that VDI server. And sure enough, had immediate access, no MFA, jumped on a call with their tech team and they couldn't believe it. So there's there's oddities like that. And to be honest, it's sometimes worth trying. Um, and it's the one out of a thousand chance, but if you do a thousand engagements, you might end up coming across it. Um, another interesting one was I hit a, it was an external um, VDI. I'm not going to name the, the vendor, but there's an external VDI type of system. And it appeared to be defunct and completely decommissioned. But the weird thing was, is when you'd hit it, it would just kind of throw weird errors. The page would render, but it was just not happy. Um, and when you tried signing in, it would just say like DNS name not found. It was just strange. Um, so I, I ended up looking at the certificate that was expired on it and found out what the um, found out what the DNS name was for that host. And it was like, just say like vdi1.example.com. I then modified my local host file to vdi one dot example.com at the IP address that that thing was sitting at rendered the website again. Sure enough, logged in the first chance had internal access off that same kind of vibe, talked to their tech team and security team. They couldn't believe it. They're like, we thought that was shut down. We tested it last year. None of us could sign in. We thought it was dead, but we were leaving it up just in case. How did you figure that out? And it's just, it's just digging a little bit deeper and having that external mapping kind of laid out with kind of question marks of like, if I do get credentials and this is my one chance getting into the environment, am I going to leave it on the table? That's kind of, you know, the vibe with that of, of make sure you follow through with everything you can. So diving into the defensive perspective, um, the preparation's key. I, I know this sounds familiar, but, and it's always easier said than done, of course, but having good patch management and inventory management externally and even doing that external mapping exercise, like I was describing earlier, where you really do map everything out and have a good foundation of what's out there, um, whether it be the IT team or the security team, or even a third party, such as penetration testers, it should be done fairly often. Um, especially when it comes to, like I was describing earlier with jumping on some of those debrief calls and, and the number of times I've heard, oh, that shouldn't be out there. It's not. And sure enough, when you show them that it is, it's, it's shocking. Um, and then that validation and verification of, is it really decommissioned? Is it really being used? Should it be out there and minimizing that external attack surface as much as possible? So this one, this one's some, a topic I enjoy talking about, especially with, with a lot of the new technologies that are out there. So enforcement through technology is not policy. I know this is a touchy subject, but wanted to call it out. Um, a lot of organizations will roll out policies, you know, more written policies of saying, hey, don't set passwords to this, set them to this. Don't click on phishing links. Don't do this. Don't do that. You always have the one end user that will ignore that and just kind of type the password to get the green meatball and the check mark at the end of the day. Um, it's best to enforce these things through technology controls or technical controls. Um, the first here on this list being password length. Um, this is a kind of a hot topic these days. I'm not putting any direct recommendations here as I know NIST has some different guidance. There's other folks that have different guidance. Um, really what I would encourage is looking at at least 12 characters. Anything that's 15 characters and above is better mainly because it makes it harder for me to guess. If it's 15 characters, I'm going to have a tough day. If it's longer than that, I'm going to have a really tough day. Um, also reducing that password rotation um, to make it easier for, for the employees. So, you know, technical controls have to go in balance with the business. So there's always that trade off of what kind of controls do I have placed to, to make the, you know, that balance and strike the balance with, with you know, the user interaction with this. Um, what we've seen really success with is increasing that character length and reducing the password rotation, you know, accommodating. If you're having to memorize a 16 character password, only do it every 180 to 365 days. Um, it makes it a lot easier for folks to remember. And it encourages them because they hate having to change it every 90 days. If you entice them with that, hey, you only have to change it once or twice a year, but it has to be longer. They kind of go, they start to enjoy it a bit more especially when you can do some fun sentences with it and encourage that kind of usage. Um, the biggest piece here that I hope everyone takes away from this is those two things will not work password rotation or password length and password rotation. If you don't have good filtering in place and that is a technical control. So what password filtering is, is essentially just saying, you know, having a technical control there, there's like Azure AD password protection or identity protection. I think that doesn't an AD Azure AD these days. Don't quote me on that one. I always mix up those services names, 
Um, but what it does, it says, hey, you can't set your password to this list of passwords that are just bad. And sometimes it can be customized most of the time. So if it's company name, one of those weird companies names I was seeing in the breach list, you can suck in entire breach lists. Um, really, when you're preventing them from using the guessable passwords, my job becomes almost near impossible of trying to find those. Um, it becomes incredibly difficult to find a 12 character password that's not something commonly used. It becomes a lot more targeted and I have to start relying on other methods. So jumping in here, um, I think we all know I was going to talk about this next is MFA enrollment and enforcement of MFA. Um, MFA should always be enforced on pretty much every service um, or the majority of all services, especially those that lead to any kind of data or internal compromise for all employees from day one. Um, part of the on like getting people online and part of getting them enrolled into the organization should be signing up for MFA that first day, a 24 hour grace period. The whole 12 to 60 day grace period just opens up the opportunity for an attacker to try to find those people and take advantage. Um, same with when it comes to enrollment, do not set a standard password for everyone. I will find it and I will leverage it to compromise as many accounts as possible. It's also a pretty bad one. Um, MFA enrollment, try to keep it internal if possible. I understand the external side, but it kind of comes down to that, you know, ease of business and ease of user interaction. So if you are exposing it externally, definitely stick to that one day enrollment period. Um, and also when it comes to enrollment allowances where, oh no, the person lost it. How do they reset it? Can they just do it online? Those security questions can be guessable. There should be a manual process on that where they, they have to talk to someone with phone in hand and a manual verification process. And the big part with this is make sure help desk is following it. Um, as a penetration tester and red teamer, I have had interactions with help desk before of resetting passwords and accounts where they do not check who I am. Um, I am not Susan from accounting. I am Nate from Praetorian and they don't check that kind of stuff and they will reset Susan's password who I have and then reset her MFA for me um, because I'm pretending to be someone I'm not. That kind of stuff is weird to say, but is is pretty common. Um, so make sure help desk is following that those kind of policies and procedures. And then of course I have to do a few plugs here. Um, practice does make perfect. Um, any kind of internal or external penetration testing, meaning a third party or an internal team of doing these kind of penetration testing and doing these kind of reviews. And it really doesn't even boil down to penetration testing or offensive security, but even just doing like third party reviews and bringing in the, the subject matter expertise when you need it. I'm not an expert on Office 365. I sometimes consult with people that do and can help me and guide me through situations. And I'm Nate. I hope organizations do the same where, especially talking about the conditional access policy stuff these days, where a tiny gap could cause an entire compromise of an organization of looking and reviewing that kind of stuff. And, and not just Office 365, but doing that for cloud providers, hosters, your on-premise infrastructure, things like that, of bringing in the people to make sure it's properly secure and organized and, and clean. Um, also reviewing any kind of policies and procedures for testing and making sure that it's collaborative and making sure you're, you're scoping it properly and getting the correct help. Um, and, and, you know, that is a touchy subject, um, but did want to kind of bring it up of, you know, make sure it's being driven for the right reasons. It's not a checkbox each year, but it's, it's a way to get better and to push the organization to, to um, become more secure. And part of that is, you know, real adversaries aren't looking for a checkbox. They're looking for a compromise. Um, granted, it, it has been kind of the world of low-hanging fruit these days, but eventually that's going to run out. And some of the more mature organizations will have have a lot of trouble. So with that, um, I do want to give a special thank you and shout out to Adam Crosser and Thomas Hendrickson. Uh, appreciate the support on this and, and the, the kind of SME review that, that I, I really appreciated. Um, as we're kind of wrapping things up here, um, I'm going to be online. Um, feel free to reach out to me, especially on Discord. I'm going to be on um, all day um, watching the, the other talks and, and being interactive. Um, if you reach out to me on Discord after today, I should be able to respond, but I'm always available on Twitter. Um, check out my GitHub. I have a few things out there, not much. I'm going to start contributing more in the future, um, but really uh, I'm going to leave the rest of the time for any kind of questions and appreciate everyone coming out and appreciate the B-Sides team for uh, accepting my talk this year. So hope everyone has a good one and enjoy the rest of the, the talks.